Taya, one of the things I mentioned that you, is that you've had a long history in the dairy industry. Uh, I think in, if you go back to your initial studies, it was in, along those lines. Could you tell us a little bit about your rise through the dairy industry and what that journey's been like? Yeah, I can, I can. Uh, of course, I'm uh, a Dutchman, like, uh, like you might know. I was born in the Netherlands. I thought I, I, I was gonna wear a suitable tie tonight because we only agreed 10 minutes before uh, we met here that we were going to wear a tie, so I thought better wear that one. And I saw some good, uh, some good Heineken beer already available here, not yet for us, but maybe later. Uh, so born in the Netherlands, um, really um, from quite a, I must say, quite a poor background uh, in the south of the Netherlands. Uh, my, both my parents lived pretty much through the Second World War. I'm the first born a child. Um, a left left wing family, uh, labor labor oriented. So, uh, but it was not much. So, so really, when I when I thought, what am I going to study? Um, I thought food brands, uh, consumers that that attracted me, and the international perspective. So I started with food technology, uh, of course, with some specializations into dairy and uh, wanted to study business straight after that, but uh, there, there was no option. Uh, again, not a lot of money, so I just knocked on the door of Friesland and I said, can I be uh, an, inter an international management trainee? And I got allowed into the program and I said, but I would like to study business as well, if you allow me. So first five years uh, as a trainee and did my business studies into uh, the MBA. So then I had food technology and an MBA. Um, and went abroad for Friesland uh, because they wanted to capture some value back, of course. Uh, went to Indonesia, the, uh, our first son got born there. Then went to the Middle East, second son got born there. Went to Peru, uh, our, our daughter uh, was born there. <laughs> so uh, back, to the, back to the Middle East, then back to the Netherlands, to Nigeria. Uh, from Nigeria again back to the Netherlands and uh, after that uh, I came here. So like you said, uh, all sorts of disciplines. So I started off in production, supply chain, uh, then wider into sales. Uh, sales went into marketing, commercial director, up to general management, and uh, in fact went through the ranks and now 28 years, almost 29 years in, uh, in the industry. Exciting and a lot of changes from, from milk is a burden, really in the European context at that time milk is a burden or was a burden with all the intervention and all the, uh, all, all, all the mountains of butters and powders, uh, to now milk is a blessing. And I said that uh, when I came to the, the management team of Friesland Foods, or the, what we call it there, the board of management, I said, first thing I said was, milk is not a, it's not a burden, guys. Milk is a blessing because demand will out, outpace supply over time. The emerging markets will rise and people need food, need safe food. So we better start preparing a strategy which is based on milk as a blessing and not a burden. And that sounds simple, but it's very, very, it, it's a 180 degree uh, turn. So sorry, it was a long answer, but. No, it was, it was a great answer. <laughs> and it, you've been all these places all over the world, uh, a Dutchman by birth, of course. Uh, Detroit would have been a better place to grow up, but. Um. <laughs> <laughs> They've not done so well recently, right? <laughs> I hear the housing market has lots of good opportunities. <laughs> Uh, so after all that journey, all those different places, uh, all the oppor opportunities that must be before you, why Fonterra? Um, of course, Fonterra was not unknown to me. So uh, Fonterra, when I, when I worked for Friesland, was, was number one, uh, a very, very reliable supplier. I can still remember when I lived in the Middle East and in Africa, I was always very happy to see the purple whole milk powder and the green skim milk powder bags coming into our gates. There was always a good source of supply. Uh, so really a reliable uh, supplier, but they were of course our competitors as well mm -hmm. and our and joint venture partners because in my Friesland time we established a joint venture with Fonterra on pharmaceutical lactose, mm -hmm. which is a very, very successful joint venture uh, still today. Um, so I knew them as a partner, as a supplier, and as a competitor, and so I knew them pretty well, but I, I knew that with the model of New Zealand and the farming model, that Fonterra was going to be in that change from a burden mm -hmm. to a blessing, that Fonterra was going to be the envy of the dairy world. So that was the ingoing position that when I, 
when I got the request to talk that I, I really felt very positive. But, I mean, if you don't have chemistry around the board table at that time, uh, if I don't feel chemistry, I don't do it. And, uh, whether it's a big job for money or for status, I'm not driven by that. There has to be chemistry. Uh, we were, I said to the board at that time, let me do an outside-in perspective and then, <coughs> and then try to give a vision and a strategy which I would drive. And if, if there would be buy-in, or if there's buy-in, then, then uh, we're good to go. But if there's no buy-in, then we better don't go together. And the third criteria for me was really uh, the family. If the family would have fallen apart, uh, because our eldest at that time was 17, just came from secondary school, and the, um, uh, the second was 15 and then 12. So if it would have fallen apart, then we would not have done it. So it was <coughs> chemistry, believe in the vision and the strategy, and keep the family together. Because for us it was kind of, this was still a time where we could move the whole family. And, and, uh, and so we did. Great. So we're all here. One is, uh, one is so sometimes, I guess, not too often in this room. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Well, we're glad that uh, he's chosen the University of Auckland. Yeah. Uh, so you talked about it being a blessing, and that's a, a, a good choice of words. That clearly speaks to opportunities. There must be challenges. So can you, can you talk about some of the challenges and opportunities in, in Fonterra's strategic context? Yeah, and I've, I've, I've chosen to bring a few of our key slides with, with our fundamental beliefs, which makes it a bit more clear. We are always talking about milk pools around the world. If you look at these circles, the circles reflect the milk, milk pools. And of course, the green, uh, the green part is what is consumed in that milk pool, and the blue part of the circle is what is produced. And then you can clearly see that, that in, in the, sorry, in the, I have to look at this. Um, in this triangle here, from Middle East, India, China, Southeast Asia, this, tri this tri triangle, you see that, that demand outpaces supply big time. Yeah? And these guys, or Europe with the quota system coming off, so they get the brick off their head, for, they had it on their head for, the four, for 25 or more years, they will become the biggest milk pool and are able, you see that the blue is bigger than the green, so they will start exporting. We always say we are the biggest, but if you look at this, we are the, we are, we are the biggest in globally traded milk, but globally traded milk is only 8% of what is consumed. Only 8%. So we, sh we are always saying we are the biggest, and I try to say we're not the biggest. Mm -hmm. We have 3%, 3 to 4% market share yeah, of, of the global arena. And yes, the blue circle is much bigger than the green, so we can export a lot. Right? right, North America, once it gets a, a, a bit simpler in North America with all rules and regulations, they will be an exporter as well. So you have three key exporters to this golden triangle of demand, right? Okay. Let them is so complex, they will be self-sufficient at best, but they won't be a, a, a net exporter. So these are always our ingoing beliefs for our strategy, we say, what is going to happen? What is the trend line of supply and demand? And then, of course, we look at other trends like aging population, because this triangle, the aging population, is, going, is possibly the biggest opportunity going forward. We all focus on infant nutrition, on babies, mm -hmm. and rightfully so, because there's a lot of value still there. Okay. But the biggest trend in five years from now, in my opinion, is the aging population, where the specific nutritional needs, yeah, and where we can create a lot of value. So. It is, in fact, follow the trend lines, starting with supply and demand, but follow the trend lines on a constant basis to, yeah, to prioritize your strategy and to really be clear to the organization what is our focus for the next uh, year right. or two to right. three years, but also where are we going to go, where do we want to be in five to ten, right? And, okay. and so, in fact, challenges, yes, but I call it more, for, for us, it's more opportunities because we have we, have, uh, we are the only ones in, in, in the world, and it's maybe good to say, who can, at this moment, can make good cash on commodities. We are able, with our farming system and with our skill, to make cash on milk commodities. The Europeans can't, the Americans can't without support, and the South Americans can't. So we are the only ones to drive cash from commodities. And if you think about that, 
that cash can be used to go up the value curve and to really drive the everyday nutrition, the advanced nutrition, so baby food, uh, milk products for aging population, that kind of things. So keep that cash cycle intact, co our commodity business, which is a beautiful business. And I know that in New Zealand context, I might get questions. We are sometimes very negative about it. We should be very proud of it. Yeah, because without our commodity business, we cannot do anything else. Mm -hmm. yeah? mm -hmm. And making money on commodities, starting from this, from this part of the world, we start at minus $150 per ton logistic cost because we are so far away and we're still able to make money and nobody else is. We should be very proud of that. Yeah, but we should not be complacent. We should not think, ah, oh, this is a beautiful cash machine, so we don't do any, anything else. We have to drive more value for the country. But we can't be negative about, about our cash generating machine. Mm. Yeah, that so piece about the aging population, um, I'm rapidly joining that group. My wife, on the other so hand, refuses to join that uh, group. <laughs> and uh, is that an educational process? Because I, as you said, I'm familiar with infant formula. I think about that being a market. Is it the doctors you have to educate, the populace, uh, or will that come from somewhere else and, and you just have to make sure the supply is there? I'm very much thinking about, uh, because if it is doctor's advice, it, you get a bit into the medical arena. Mm -hmm. And that could be an opportunity, but I prefer to stay away because that's for pharmaceutical companies. Um, we, we run a beautiful device in Asia, a bone scan, where people come into a supermarket, put their, f their foot uh, in the bone scan, mm -hmm. and uh, it's measured for osteoporo osteoporosis, right? I so we should think about co-innovation of that scan, in my opinion, that the same, uh, or that we scan for muscles, veins, bones, uh, mm. yeah, that, that you do a whole scan based on scanning a foot of, of somebody who gets older right. and gets an instant advice on you need more protein or you need more calcium or you need more both or you need uh, that that is kind of so when you think when you look at the coffee world yeah the coffee world where we were milling beads uh, 20 years ago putting it in a stupid filter and then put water on top of it and then mm -hmm. you look where they are now with the machines and the products right. that is a co-innovation which is which is fantastic right and, right. and i think that's the answer for aging population, that you have these scans, instant scans, that you, you're not sick, that you're healthy, mm -hmm. you get a scan, and you get an advice right. on how to stay healthy, right? Rather than going to a doctor, because most of the time when you go to the doctor, there's a problem. Right, it's reactive. Yeah. yeah. So but the scan would be proactive. Would be proactive, yeah. yeah. Exactly. So that kind of things we should, we should really think about, because in, that, in this part of the world where demand is so high, uh, there will be 400 million people, more people over 65 years old, <coughs> yeah, by 2025. 400 million. Mm -hmm. I mean, a massive. Yeah. Right. But you need to, yeah, you need to be proactive. So I want to go back to that comment about <coughs> coming to Fonterra because you knew they were going to be the envy of the world. Can you talk a little bit about that journey? How that, uh, what the progress yeah. has been since you've been here, and, and where you see it going? Yeah. I can, and I have, I've put it uh, for the board, and Ralph is here as well, um, uh, and it's Sunday, uh, sometimes on a, on a piece of paper, because uh, when, especially a year ago, when we were in the middle of a crisis, and we looked behind us, and uh, we didn't have a lot of friends behind, anymore behind us. Uh, but then, then you need to do a few things. You need to keep the business running. Uh, you, need to, you need to manage the crisis, but you also need to uh, uh, put an ambition out. Yeah? You need to show the organization what's the journey. Mm -hmm. yeah? Because people go in the crisis, they go in detail, day to day, minute by minute, micromanagement, and that's needed mm -hmm. at that time. But you need to have a perspective as well. Right. Right? So this is the slide which, which I kind of crafted myself on, on, on a Sunday where I said, what, what, what's, uh, what journey am I going through and what journey do I take the co-op through and the farmers and the employees and everybody? So here you see that on the left hand side, really a very proud New Zealand co-op. And sometimes the pride is not showing, but we should be very proud. With very strong values and a very strong story and, and really, really good that Fonterra got formed because scale out of New Zealand is so important, right? So all the basics are good. 
when I came in, we were talking about, we were doing an IPO called Trading Amongst Farmers, but we did not have a clear value proposition, a clear strategy going forward. So we had the, our government here, our farmers there, the financial world somewhere there, and it was all over the place. So we, we really, we really fast-tracked our strategy called V3, mm -hmm. Volume, Value, Velocity, with seven, seven key strategic pathways and, and now 55 roadmaps of execution. The being made example of last week is one of the roadmaps. Um, and that's shifting volume to higher value. So be proud of the commodity business, but make sure that the new milk is not ending up as a, commodi as a commodity, because we have mm -hmm. enough, mm -hmm. but ending up as, as a, as a um, value add product. So that's what we call strategy into action was turning the wheel. We launched it in 13. And just this year we launched our This is Fonterra framework, the whole holistic proposition where the light blue piece, and I can quickly shift to this one, is our strategy. So that's volume, value, velocity, really with our seven pathways and 55 roadmaps. But we also told the organization, we really said we have to work on our identity. Yeah, so the whole crisis from recall, review, recover and rebuild that was going into this. How do we build our identity stronger? <coughs> and which, what is our focus? Yeah, because you can't do everything because then it becomes, chari it becomes charity, right? So really focus on how to build our identity and really how to build that strong team, one Fonterra, not Fortress Fonterra, and no uh, uh, arrogance levels have to go down. Connection with our stakeholders have to go up. So that's what we launched and, sorry, um, but really, the ambition which we put out there was that globally relevant co-op. So the journey from the proud New Zealand co-op, mm -hmm. yeah, New Zealand to the world, collect a lot of white liquids, make white powder, put it in a container and ship it and make cash, to a globally relevant co-op based on this wheel, where it's not only making money with your strategy, but it's also who are you? What's the perception around you, out there? How do stakeholders think about you? Right? Mm -hmm. Because that's part of your, your value proposition. And how do you connect your people to this, uh, to what you go for, strategy, and what you stand for? So right. the turning the wheel piece and velocity, are those two in the same things or are those different concepts? Uh, no, turn, turning the wheel talks more about volume and value. So turning the wheel is really, is really meant to say we, sh we, wa we really want to shift more volume existing volume, but also new volume, because every year the milk pool grows by 3%. Mm -hmm. So we want to shift it to higher value. So the wheel is really about volume and value. Uh, when you talk about velocity, then basically it's two things. It's really v you, the, the, the velocity of your cash cycle, that, that we make sure that our inventory turns, as we call it, uh, or uh, we were at inventory turns of 2.8, but I think a company <coughs> per year. Mm -hmm. But a company like Fonterra, even though we have that huge milk curve, we should be at four or five. Yeah? So that's the velocity of your business, cash to cash. But it's also the velocity of execution. Yeah? And right. velocity of execution, the, the culture was very much what I found. Um, be sure, be 120% sure before you say yes to something. And what I'm trying to say is, if we know where we're going and we trust each other, at 80% right, push the green button and we go. And sometimes we're wrong and then we just help each other to correct. But 80% right is sufficient to go. If, you, if that's in the right direction and you trust your team, 80% right, go. Do the rest on the way. And if things go wrong, sometimes things go, things go wrong, right? Mm -hmm. But velocity of execution is very important because yeah, if you want to be 120% right, you find yourself always back of the pack in a competitive field, always. Right. right. Good is better than perfect. Yeah. 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 So, right. so that gets me up to the present day. Uh, what's the ambition for Fonterra? We take this enviable position. Uh, what's What's the next chapter? Yeah. So, so the ambition is really um, what this is the last part of, or no, not the last part, but really what we want to drive. Mm -hmm. That globally relevant co-op, and the globally relevant co-op really. Again, this is some mind mapping, not from a consultant, but really from ourselves and from myself. Because you can say globally relevant cope, it's beautiful, but what does it really mean? It doesn't mean the largest exporter in dairy. It doesn't mean 
uh, um, exporting 2.8 uh, million tons uh, over oceans, close the container doors here, and you don't know where it's going to end up, and you don't know who is going to consume it. That's what it does not mean. That's, okay. that's our perception right now, the largest exporter. So in my mind, we should become a co-op which makes a difference in the lives of 2 billion people. And that means, that already says that you want to, from the exporter, which stops halfway, that you really want to connect to that consumer, yeah? or mm -hmm. customer, mm -hmm. minimum, much mm -hmm. better, but pre preferably the consumers of the customers. Right. Yeah? So you really want to have the integrated model from cow to consumer, you want to have more control over that. So what does that mean in terms of milk pools? We were present in, let's say, two or three milk pools in a significant way. We want to be present in five or six. That's why we are investing in Europe. We were not in Europe at all. Yeah? And now through partnerships, we have, we have said we, w we are going to be in Europe. And we are already in uh, collecting, or we are going to collect two billion liters of milk, direct and indirect. Right? So five or six milk pools, three in the Northern Hemisphere, yeah, so it's China, Europe, and North America, mm -hmm. and three in the Southern Hemisphere, that's uh, South America, Australia, and New Zealand. And not, that's not a coincidence, because the seasons go opposite, right? or they, go, they contradict. So to be in the Northern Hemisphere and in the Southern Hemisphere, I think over time, with milk as a blessing, is very important. So six, five to six milk pools, then you see turnover, why turnover? At this moment, or last year, we were 22 billion liters of milk, 20 billion turnover. So that's 0.9 per liter. The world of dairy is at one US dollar. So it's at 1.2 New Zealand dollars. So w if you like, we are 25 or more percent behind the pack. And that's why we have to turn the wheel. Okay. If we don't shift volumes to higher value, we have to reach that one US dollar, not New Zealand dollar per liter. And that means 1.2 New Zealand dollar. We are now at 0.9. So that's a 30% uh, increase. Um, how do we do that? We have to stay number one in ingredients. So I'm not downplaying ingredients. I'm not downplaying the, 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 the scale commodity business, but we have to do value-add ingredients, consumer brands, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Right? So, but we have to protect our number one in ingredients because that, that generates uh, this part generates the cash to go into mm -hmm. our key consumer markets. And we have selected eight. We, we are operating in 93 right now. We all rate them the same. But we have said we select eight where we put 90% of our resources, right? And that means advertising and promotion, people, research and development, the whole nine yards. So we have four markets only around the world where we are leaders. That's New Zealand, Malaysia, <coughs> Yeah, that's uh, Chile and Sri Lanka. If you add those four, that's less than 100 million people. So that doesn't really bring you to the 2 billion ambition. Mm -hmm. So we have added China, we have added Australia, Brazil, um, and we have added, uh, uh, sorry, I was in and Indonesia. So if you have those four added, yeah, and we, have, we already have good positions, and we grow to a number one or two, then, then you really build that platform with these markets to go to that ambition, right? to the two bil billion people, yeah. right? And staying number one in ingredients, that's very important. And as per the wheel, for me, it's very important that in these eight markets, we really are top three on the reputational ladder. So we have to work on sustainability, we have to work on corporate social responsibility, and we have to work on our stakeholders because that arrogant perception which is around us that has to disappear mm -hmm. and we can only do that through world-class people and world-class engagement right and I want, I want to come back to that point but before I do you, when you said the word control uh, as a strategy faculty member I immediately think of uh, vertical integration and acquisitions but you're also doing a lot of partnering is there a, is there a preferred way to get more control over cash to con uh, cow to consumer if that's yeah, but in some markets we can do that easily our, ourselves. Uh, and even in some markets like Australia, we think we can do that through consolidation. But in China, uh, China for us was five years ago, was uh, 500 million turnover. Now we have 5.5 billion. But 5.5 billion in the context of China being a 60 billion market is still not that big. So if you really want to go to a number one or two position, mm -hmm. you have to do it through partnerships. 
But these partners have to be, or number one, they have to be customers of us, of our beautiful powder from New Zealand, okay. cash. Yeah. Uh, they have to believe in an integrated model, so the end-to-end, -end, and it needs to be us and them. Eh? We need to complement each other. Right. And like what we announced last week, they need to be willing to share knowledge and brands downstream yeah? to create more value towards the consumer. Mm -hmm. because so these are the three criteria we use for partnerships, yeah, and they they apply all three. So being made is a good is a good example, right? Key customer, willing to develop upstream, and willing to share downstream. Okay. And that's why we did it. Good. And it's fast. So we were on a on a roll of going from 500 million to 5.5 billion. Uh, but if you want to go even faster, then um, this partnership is going to help. So you, you talked about making a difference in the lives of people and there I think you were talking globally and you talked about corporate res social responsibility and that could either be in a domestic or a, a global context. Uh, what do you see as Fonterra's role in New Zealand with respect to social responsibility, with respect to um, making a difference in people's lives? Yeah, and it's maybe back to the, this wheel and that's my fundamental belief. You could also think about this wheel, it's, it's, it's profit, it's planet and its people, right? You, mm -hmm. It's a bit along those lines, of course. Uh, but you can perform and you can uh, drive the economy, bring a lot of cash home, good revenue lines. But if we don't, if we are not taking care of the country and of the people in, in the country here in New Zealand, so your question was New Zealand, mm -hmm. but in fact it applies for all eight strategic markets. But um, when I, when I had that conversation with the board and I got the message in June uh, 2011, uh, hey, you will become our CEO, I, was full, I asked for Fonterra in the news every day because yeah, I wanted to know what was going on. And, and, and what you really read was consumer price of milk, so you don't feed your children. Your cows are in the river yeah, and you mm -hmm. don't share wealth. So with these perceptions, and it was more than perceptions, part of it was real, is real. Okay. Yeah. You don't feel to feed your children, your cows in the river, and you don't share wealth. You, we're on the light blue part of the wheel, you're going nowhere. Yeah, you will hit the brick wall. So we have to, that's why we say a responsible dairying means fencing the waterways, planting the waterways. The nutrition for all means what we have rolled out. 170,000 children in New Zealand have our milk every day. Because 27% of New Zealand children at that time mm -hmm. did not have a one milk serving before noon. I mean, really? It's just unacceptable. You cannot be the largest exporter in dairy and, and, and trying to make money on this side globally right. and you don't take care of the, of, of the key issues in the nation. Impo it's impossible because you're going nowhere. In the end, you're going nowhere. Yeah, so, and that's for me. So, so uh, sustainability and corporate social responsibility is not charity for me. It has to support light blue and dark blue have to go hand in hand. Yeah, because nutrition is very, ex very important for our business as well. Right? Right. Responsible dairying, if you talk about the integrated chain, is, is crucial. Right? So you have to choose these topics where you, where you make a difference. And I think with a globally relevant co-op, if you really go to two billion people, um, there's still four billion people in the world who are live below two dollars a day, right? And we ship, or we reach uh, at the moment 1.5 billion people, direct and indirect. Yeah, but we, we don't use our milk powder, or our commodities, uh, to fortify. Yeah, the key deficiencies in the world are still vitamin A, iron, iodine, zinc. So my belief here is if you want to be globally relevant, why not fortify? And it's not so easy because putting iron in milk gives a gray color and all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. So but find solutions to really address issues in the world. Right? And I don't think it's that, it's that complicated, but, but that's what I mean with globally okay. relevant. So, and that means that's a part of sustainability and corporate social responsibility as well, that you're seen with the World Health Organization and UNICEF to, to make a difference yeah, with the 30 billion liters of milk and protein. Right? Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Well, we, we've talked a lot about uh, Fonterra. I'd like to 
bring it down to the individual level for just a minute. Um, we've had all these varied experiences, varied cultures, uh, different parts of the business, uh, affected a large merger and acquisition, uh, moved to a different company as CEO. <coughs> Can you reflect back and distill some leadership lessons? If my MBAs ask me next week, what did Teos have to say about yeah. uh, that I can put to practice uh, from a leadership's perspective? Um, yeah, my lessons, my lessons, in fact, do not, believe it or not, but do not come straight from a from an MBA book. Um, <laughs> <laughs> can we write one together? Yeah, yeah we could. No, but I think for, for myself, it's, it's really, and, and you do these things when you're at a crossroad, when you just come out of a merger in, in Europe and you decide to go your own way, then you, you reflect on what you've done. And um, then you look at your own values, first and foremost. And, and for me, and that's, that's, also, that's what I try to do in leadership as well, clarity is crucial. If, and clarity can mean can mean uh, positive stuff, but it can also mean, you can be very clear, but it can mean, or it might mean negative as well, or negative message, right, for people. Mm -hmm. But if you, if you are, are clear in the organization of where you're going, yeah, and what you're going to do, and what you're not going to do, and what you're going to tolerate, and what you're not going to, tol to tolerate, that's the first and foremost. Where are we going? What's the clarity for myself, but also for the organization? Second for me is, is, is the respect, or the, that's the other side of the arrogance part, where we, have, we are perceived to be ar arrogant. We have to gain respect around the world, and you have to work in multiple cultures, uh, and you know possibly how difficult that is, because if you work in Africa and South America, if you don't show intrinsic respect as a human being for their culture, you're, g you're going nowhere. Right. Yeah, so you have to be clear, that can be black and white sometimes, but you have to respect uh, people and, and, and cultures. And then you have to build a team with velocity and 80% right and successes and, and, and have fun as well. Uh, that's, that, that's really the three, di three dimensions which are, which are very important for myself and how I look at the organization every day. But when you talk to your students, um, I think that clarity piece is very, the focus on what they want to, what they want to achieve, right? Mm -hmm. uh, that's number one. Number two for the students is never stop learning. And learning doesn't mean books, but learning means shift from production jobs to, to supply chain, to commercial, take risks, mm -hmm. right? That's, mm -hmm. that's really very important. And, and a key lesson, and I've seen that in, and, we, and Ralph and I see that in the organization, uh, people who go through the ranks and, and are brought up in a kind of we are number one, yeah, we are the biggest. Yeah, they, 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 they go on to a behavior which is taught to them, right? So they move away from who they are. So you have to stay authentic. <coughs> you have to stay close to your own values. Yeah, so you need to focus. You need to be able to learn all the time and keep on learning. But you have to stay close to yourself. And people going through the ranks lose themselves. A lot of people lose themselves. And I dare to say more than 50% of people going through the ranks lose themselves or, or, or move away from who they really are as a person. So they haven't adopted managerial behavior based on politics and based on process and based on I don't know what. Okay. But, but try to stay as close as possible to who you, who you really are. And if, you're, if, if who you are does not match anymore with the company, you should leave. Really, or you should look for the, for another opportunity. So you're a brand of sorts, and your brand either fits in the portfolio or it, or it doesn't. It doesn't. Yeah. yeah, but don't move away from yourself. Yeah, but be focused what you want to achieve or where where where, where you want to go right. for sure, and stay eager to learn. And that that bit about clarity, I uh, I understand how it's easy or maybe not easy, but easier to get clear for yourself, and maybe to really roll that message out to your immediate management team. But how do you roll it down all the different levels across all the different locations? Um. Uh, it starts at the top, I, th I believe. And, um, and what, uh, when, when, when we launched This is Frontera and we really spoke around our, our values and what behaviors. So we really said our four values means this is the behavior we want to see. 
And we did a kind of very quick uh, 360 around the organization for people. Do you, do you live the values or are you not living the values, including myself? And we had an international management forum in China and I just put my score, how I rank myself on where I'm good and where I need to improve up on these two big screens. And just talk about it. Yeah, and, if, and if the top do, does that and is open about it, um, the organization will follow and it will go very fast. Okay. Well, you've had to endure my questions for about 40 minutes now. Uh, I think it's time to give the audience uh, a chance to ask questions. Um, so let me answer that in two, two on, on, in two blocks. The first, uh, the, the political block. I'm I'm not a politician, and I'm not going to make sta statements around that. But I do know, and I have seen in um, in uh, Europe as well, that campaigning is something different different than being in charge. Right? So you can campaign, campaign something, but if you're in charge, uh, the economy has to continue as well. So I'm not going to say more, more around that. And, but you're absolutely right. I mean, if there's political changes and, and we would not have acted uh, or started to act two, two years ago, or it's now 18 months ago, our farmers have fenced 23,500 kilometers, that's from here to London, in, in, in 15 to 18 months, fence the waterways. So if we are not working on that, you will get a massive, at a certain point in time, you will get, you will get a massive bill, right? Because if you don't solve uh, the problems, and, and if you don't make, or if you're not sure that you do sustainable farming, yeah, and you continue the way we possibly did it, 10 years ago, the end of the story will be legislation, penalties, court cases, taxes, carbon taxes, it's all the wrong things, right? Because all that money goes into a pot and then possibly roads are being built and the emission still continues. But yeah, so, so we have to, we as, as business, we have to make sure that we prevent these things. And you, you've heard me possibly saying that we are 10 years late, and I mean that really. And, and I'm not saying the farmers. People think that I'm saying the farmers. I'm not. We, as such, we are such a big company. In 2003 and 4, we were writing a sustainability strategy in Europe, in the Netherlands, for our customers and for all our stakeholders. Because 3 million cows in the, on the size of a Waikato with 16 million people in a country which is two-thirds below the water below the sea, it's not easy, <laughs> right? So you better make sure that you have a sustainability plan and that you execute, yeah? and same here. So people should not tell me it's not possible in, in, in New Zealand, it is possible, right? But you're absolutely right, if, if you don't do it, you will get a massive bill, and that money n does not necessarily end up in the right place. Yeah. Your question is very valid. I, I think if you're, if you're uh, brought up in, in consumer goods, yeah, or if you're brought up in service industry, or maybe I'm not saying it rightly, Ralph, but you know what I mean, I'm, I'm, that, that is significantly different, right? But if you're brought up in consumer goods, um, could I shift to a Philips or, or to a Unilever or to, I think I can, yeah? And should I have done that? I didn't, I didn't opt for that because I had the functional shifts in, in my career, and I had the, the huge differences, or I opted for functional and geographies. So I've worked in five, uh, five continents around the world, and that was my, my choice. And I can tell you, my learnings in Nigeria were slightly different from my learnings in Indonesia. <laughs> yeah, so, but it is, it is a choice, but, I, but if you ask me whether with, with my background and CV, whether I could potentially shift to a GE or let's say a branded, a branded consumer products company, not food, I think, I think you can, because you talk about, you talk about the same, dyna or same dynamics with different companies, but it is same DNA. If you ask me, could you, and should you, uh, shift to run a bank, uh, I would uh, have to think a few nights uh, about that. 
<laughs> yeah? Coming back to, you, to your question, it was two, yeah. two questions ago, but, but I think you know, maybe the question what, what, what I've really, in the New Zealand context, what, I've, what struck me most was the, the, the magnitude and the importance of Fonterra for, for the country. And you read about it you know, far away, and I knew about it when I was with another cooperative, but but you can only um, yeah you can only really do it or you can only talk about it if you have experienced it. So that's that's really and there's not one country or a business in a country which has a ratio like Fonterra has. And that's why we should not and Ralph agrees with me 100% on that. We should not talk about we're the biggest of New Zealand, we're the biggest of this. No, we only have three to four percent market share in that world, and we better make sure that it becomes five or six. Yeah, and and that we drop that arrogance and yeah, and talking at people rather than talking with people, right? Hmm. Yeah, it's a very good question. And if you if you look at the demographics and you project nine billion people uh, relatively soon, and you look at income levels and you look at at urbanization trends and all that, yeah, and you think around those milk pools, yeah, and, and, and can we feed all those people in a safe <coughs> way? Yeah, that's the first, for me, the first question, in a safe way. Uh, the way we have been doing it in the past, the answer is potentially no. Yeah, we need to think of different, different uh, routes to market. Uh, we might uh, I know that genetic or, or genetically modified is a big thing and a big theme around the world, and nobody dares to talk about it. But we need to start talking about it, and we need to start putting uh, to put science behind it that it's not <coughs> something bad and evil, but it is something which is possibly needed over time, and maybe it's called different uh, at that time with with different science. But if we if we don't think different, we're not going to be able to feed nine billion people. And, and we're definitely not going to be able to feed them safely. Yeah, so we need to, uh, <coughs> the lact or, or the lactose intolerance thing is, is, is again a different example. I mean, if you have special needs, if people have special needs, like the aging guys, and <laughs> yeah, then, 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 then you modify and you innovate, right? Uh, same for lactose intolerance. But, but the bigger question for me is how are we going to feed people and how are we going to feed them safely, right? And we need to not shy away from uh, certain topics. And, and that's the same for soy. Uh, could soy become uh, part of the protein uh, base for, for milk products? I think it could. Now we have one, one we have uh, milk for schools, of course, there's 170,000 uh, children, and then we have a, the, the government, or we run together with government on a 50-50 basis, the kickstart breakfast, for really uh, the, the poor children who, who have really uh, strong nutritional uh, needs, so they have both. Um, yes, we can do more, but I mean, I'm looking at the eight strategic markets, at the two, at, at the two billion ambition, and, and I think next to New Zealand, we need to do, st uh, when we, if we say Sri Lanka, and if we say Indonesia, then we need to, we need to think nutrition, we need to think how to help the farmers to, to really s farm sustainable. Um, uh, we have to think about water, yeah, because uh, water uh, is a big problem in those countries. It's not input into farms, but it's input into the milk products, yeah, because powder with water becomes milk, and if it's good powder but bad water, still a bad product. So we, uh, yes, we can do more, but we need to to balance. Um, yeah, we need to we need to balance our activities around the world, really. Um, <coughs> the 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 New Zealand brand, um, and then I mean, the clean and green country. I'm not talking about 100% pure taglines and that kind of stuff because we have to distinguish, right? So brand New Zealand for us is, or is a blessing, clean and green. And the, the pasture, uh, the 100% the, the pasture-based milk farming delivers a significantly different taste yeah, in our products, in butter. Yeah, so it's not quality, people say quality, right? 
quality is a you have to really comply, but it's not a differentiator. But our our 12 months pasture-based farming leads to a different taste in butter, a different taste in 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 creams, yeah, a different taste in milk powders. People can distinguish even uh, to the extent that whether milk comes from the North or the South Island, right? Climate-wise, and so we have a distinct uh, product taste, and that and that demands sometimes a premium. Yeah, but if you talk brand New Zealand from with a tagline, I think the country should do much more, and we should help the country really to drive that, yeah? because the, 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 the fern, um, or whatever we're going to use, but, but the fern is so strong, look at the airline, um, the fern should really uh, be a seal of quality, or a seal of guarantee um, for, for, for the best food producers in New Zealand. But that's a different discussion, right? So you have two discussions, clean and green and taste preference, and you have that seal, that, which is called brand New Zealand, but it's not loaded at this point in time, and, and it's not used sufficiently by, by the key uh, players from New Zealand, in my opinion. Hmm. Yeah, the, the, the sale of far, farmland to foreign uh, investors. <coughs> Again, block one, I'm not a politician. <laughs> yeah, block, block two, if there's rules, there's rules in a country. And if, and if a, a guy with, a, with an orange tie coming from Holland can buy land, then, then a Chinese should be able to buy land. And, if, and, and like in China, we cannot buy land, but the Chinese people cannot buy land. Not one square meter of China is owned by a Chinese. Yeah, it's owned by the government. So rules are rules and you can't discriminate. Does that answer your question? And I know that I have made a, politi a political statement. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Now that's that's why uh, with Kotai, the company we have uh, we have formed, we are really talking about: is 11 ports for New Zealand? Is that the most efficient thing to do, or not? Yeah. Or should should we have less ports, deeper waterways, bigger ships? Yeah, because 3,000 containers on a ship is nothing. Out of Europe, you have ships of 22,000. And I'm not saying that that should happen here, but scaling up to 8,000 or to 10 would help. Yeah, so in that sense, if we, if we um, opt to, 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 to not go forward, uh, then we lose resilience pretty fast. Yeah, because again, like Europe to China, they get free, free shipment because China exports and otherwise it would come back empty. So they, they almost ship powder for free from Europe to, uh, to China. And that's what we have to work against. So we have to get the 8,000 container ships at a certain point in time. Um, now, a, a co-op, first of all, has, has huge advantages, right? Because uh, think about, uh, and, and that's why we're talking in these five or six milk pools, we have to be able to connect farmers over borders. Because connection with farmers means a security of supply, number one. But it also means that you, that you really have a strong relationship with your shareholder. The shareholder is not unknown, right? You have a strong relationship, you know who they are, and you know um, where to reach them and how to talk to them, right? And yes, I know that there were a lot of opinions and what farmers would want or would not want in New Zealand. Um, and I have heard many times that farmers would be resisting uh, certain progress, whether it's milk for schools, which is not a cheap initiative, or whether it is going offshore um, and investing money. Um, but so far, with our strategic approach and with the journey and the pathway and why we do it, I mean, farmers are are people who are genuine, that we're talking about uh, the authenticity part, they are 100% authentic. So they say when they like it, and they say when they don't like it. But if you, if you give them clear reasons to believe why this is going to create value for them, they will buy it, and even more than that, they will support it. They will be ambassadors. And, and I, don't, I have not uh, seen much of resistance in, uh, against what we're doing 
uh, from the farmer base. Of course, the fluctuation of the milk price, like what happened last night again, uh, the, the volatility, nobody likes that, right? But I have only felt uh, support from our farmers. And when I just, I was joking about a year ago, when the crisis hit us hard, um, in fact, when I looked behind, there was only one group d there, and there were the farmers. Yeah, <coughs> in, in consumer goods, um, <coughs> if you don't have a branded proposition, you can innovate what you like, but you're never going to create um, significantly more value, right? So you have to first select your key brands. Uh, we used to have 60 brands active and supported. We're going back to five. Yeah, so five key brands in eight key markets, and that's where 90% of, of all resources are going to go. Then you have to, you have to load these brands yeah, with brand or brand equity, but you have to give re reasons to believe, and th that's what we call benefit platform. So we have selected five of those bene benefit platforms. For baby food, it's, it's cognition. Yeah, for aging uh, population, it's, uh, it's really um, uh, the, the, the knowledge we have on bone, health, we, we, we can widen that. When we were talking about everyday nutrition, we talk about taste, texture, and so we've, we have really defined five benefit platforms for our brands, which we load with about 45 different pro uh, projects. We used to have in Palmerston North with 400 people in research and development, more than 180 projects. We're going back to only 25% loading five platforms and five brands, but we might spend more. Yeah, but if it's, not, if, if it's not connected innovation, your, your question is innovation, not research, yeah, because innovation for me is pull from the brands and the consumer, and research could be push, right? And, and, and for me, innovation is about 70% of your spend, and research is about 30% of your spend. But it has to be focused. It has to be focused on, on areas where you can win with your brands and you have strong reasons to believe. And you have to look at your, your strength then. We can think about going completely out of the box and going to invent all sorts of new things on prebiotics and probiotics, which we did before as well. And we fight head on with, with, with people who are much better at, at that theme, yeah? digestion uh, and gut health. There's players who are much stronger than us, so don't go there. Yeah? Take your strength. Take, take this taste advantage, texture advantage, take uh, cognition, take bone health, yeah? and, and get stronger. Answers your question? Yeah. Thank you. Now, world, world, worldwide, there are only, there are only uh, or to date, there are outside of the Western world, but in the emerging markets, there's, there's, there's only three markets where, where soy is really competing with milk. And that's Thailand and it's Vietnam. Yeah, they, 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 they are the top two, right? So that's where there's competition. And in all the other emerging markets, it's going to be complementary. And as per the uh, previous question, um, feeding 9 billion people in, in big cities um, requires yeah, a combination of the two. And I think that dairy players, um, if we would opt to have up to 25% of the protein in milk servings, soy-based over time, to address that key uh, issue in the world, should not, be an, should not be a problem. The problem starts when it is 80 to 100%, because then it doesn't, uh, it doesn't help our farmers, it doesn't help our shareholders, right? If we, if we replace milk protein to soy, 100%, yeah, then, then we undermine the co-op, right? But going hand in hand at a good balanced uh, percentage should not be an issue. So Teo, we could keep you here all night with questions, but I, uh, I really appreciate the straight talk and as a new kid in town, uh, the opportunity to have uh, had this conversation Thank you. with you. I'm gonna turn it over to Dean Whitford.